Please take your copy of God's Word and turn to Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to be reading the first 10 verses of this second chapter as we consider the theme of grace, indeed grace alone, as this, these 10 verses most definitely highlight for us. Ephesians chapter 2, I'll begin reading with verse 1, reading through verse 10. This is God's word. Let's give diligent attention to it as it is read in your hearing this afternoon. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not, as a, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the living and true God. Let's pause and ask for his help now as we consider this portion of it uh, together. Let's pray. Our Father, now as we humble ourselves even before a passage in which we are all very familiar, we would ask that you would instruct us, you would teach us, that your spirit would attend to all that is said and all that is heard. We pray, O Father, that as we examine this passage, as we hear it, that we would have a renewed understanding of the infinite grace that you have poured out upon undeserving people, and that we might then look to heaven and stand in awe of the great God who pours out his love upon sinners. Be merciful to us, even now we ask for Christ's sake. Amen. Each one of you, undoubtedly, as you watch your televisions from time to time, will see a commercial, a commercial that seeks to sell to you a product, and the way they try to sell that product to you is they show you a before picture And then they show you what will happen if you use their product, the after picture. You've seen those commercials usually with uh, weight loss products of some nature. And they're designed to highlight uh, the benefits of using that product. But the fact is, even as we sit here this afternoon, even as Christians... We have a before and after picture ourselves. It may not be a weight loss picture. It may not be some other before and after picture, but we certainly have one definitively. We have the picture of what we were before the grace of God found us and what we are now. We have the picture that highlights for us the ugliness of our state and our nature the rebellious ways in which we live, the wickedness of our own souls, the hardness of heart and the blindness of eye, the deaf ear, and all the ways in which we disobeyed the God of heaven. And then we have that after picture, don't we? If you know the Lord Jesus Christ this afternoon, you have that picture. 
In some sense, in some form, maybe immature or maybe maturing or a complete maturity as we look forward to glory, but we have it. We have it because of God, because of his grace, his mercy, his love, and demonstrating that in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Put a different way, as one who has the after picture, you have it because you are recipients of the good news, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And oftentimes, in a sermon is of, of this nature, it is very easy for all of us to grow uh, bored, even thinking that I've heard this before, I know the story. But my friends, this story, that is, of course, the good news, the gospel of grace and mercy and kindness poured out in Christ and given to us, should never be old. It is something that you and I must and should reflect upon every single day of our lives. Because the cross of Christ and the grace of God is not in our rearview mirror, is it? It is in front of us. And it must always be in front of us if we're to see that after picture being perfected and, uh, and perfected by God as we grow to full manhood. I wonder, friends, this, this afternoon, how much time in recent days, or even this day, have you spent reflecting on the grace of God, his mercy to you, the fact that he is not and has not treated you as your sins deserve, but instead has treated you with great kindness and love. How much time have you spent, children, reflecting on the reality that you are being raised by a mom and dad who love the Lord and recognizing that that too is an act of grace on God's part to put you into a family that will bring you to church and show you and raise you in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You see, everything that happens to you and to me in this life is certainly an act of God's grace. Because what is it that you deserve? What is it that I deserve? Eternal torment, judgment, death. But instead, as Paul highlights it for us in these 10 verses, instead of receiving what we deserve, we receive what we don't deserve. And we earn, we, we get to us through the earning work of Jesus Christ that which we could never, ever earn, even if we're to live a million lifetimes. Now, the one who wrote these words in Ephesians 2, he certainly knew something about grace, didn't he? The Apostle Paul, the insolent opponent and blasphemer and murderer of Christians, who in a gracious act of the Lord Jesus Christ met him on that road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, and saved him, brought him to, uh, to faith in Christ. And so it's not a surprise indeed that the whole concept of grace is scattered across all of his writings, just as it is here in the second chapter in Ephesians. The book of Ephesians has been argued as one of the most clearest declarations of Christian doctrine and theology outside of Romans. It is here that Paul highlights, he zeroes in on the, the, the focal point of everything that matters when it comes to the gospel. And what is it that matters? That God is a God of grace. That God is a God of grace. 
So as we consider these words together this afternoon, I want to show you with the help of the Spirit of God, His amazing grace. Maybe we should have sang that song. I thought of it after the bulletins were printed, of course, so we didn't. But I'm going to show you in these 10 verses the amazing grace of our God in heaven and how we must and how we should respond to it even as Paul directs us here in this text. Three points as we consider these 10 verses. First, we will consider what we were. It is vitally important that we remind ourselves, even as Paul reminds the church at Ephesus, what we were before the grace of God found us. And then we will consider what God did. What did he do? And then we will consider finally what we are now. Put a different way, we will look at the before picture. And then we are going to consider the picture that is now yours due to the grace of God himself. Let's first consider in the first three verses what we were. The Apostle Paul writes in the past tense as he addresses the church at Ephesus. It is probably a circular letter. It probably went to many churches in that region, but it carries the name of the, that church there in Ephesus. And he writes in the past tense by simply saying, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Paul begins to describe a picture that existed before God's grace found you. He begins to describe and give a description of this spiritual death that was part and parcel of every single person that has ever been born. Except for maybe John the Baptist and Jeremiah. A description of a death. Not an ordinary death, not a death that would highlight a physical aspect because he's writing to people that are very much alive, but a spiritual death, one that renders a person unfit, unable, without any hope in the world to stand before a holy God with any integrity, with anything at all. What does he mean when he says that they are dead in their transgressions and in their sins. One commentator highlighting this idea of dead simply says that the term here, translated dead, conveys the idea of one being destitute of a life that recognizes and is devoted to God. It highlights a nature, an attitude, a lifestyle, everything, every thought, every act, every single thing as antithetical to what God himself demands. Another commentator goes on to say this death does not mean cessation of being, but a condition of separation and alienation from God. This is what Paul is driving home. He's driving it home in the past tense. He is writing to the visible church. He is writing to people who have professed faith in Christ. He wants them to see just how amazing the grace of God is for them by starting with the ugliness, the bad news, the misery that would be all of ours indeed if not for the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are two aspects of this spiritual death uh, that I've summarized really under two separate categories that I want to just briefly highlight in a cursory fashion, as Paul here does it as well. When he says these things, these death, the, the, the death of our trespasses and sins are the way we lived. Notice how he expresses it in verse 2, in which you once walked. My congregation would know, at least should know, that I've said this before, that 
This is one of Paul's favorite phrases, expressions, terms. To walk, to live, to behave. He's describing for us various aspects of this spiritual death that were part and parcel of every breath we took before the grace of God found us. First, Paul highlights our natural bent uh, towards sin. No one had to teach you to sin. No one had to teach me to sin. No one had to teach your children. No one has to teach anybody to sin. We all are born sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Each one of us inherit naturally a bent a rebellion, an affinity with sin itself. What does Jeremiah tell us about the heart of man? It's desperately wicked. Who can understand it, he asks? It's rhetorical. The answer is no one. The heart of man is desperately wicked. And we know that Jesus himself said that it's from the heart that all of these evil things, these these sinful things, these, these rebellious things that show up in our lives come from that wicked heart, that hard heart, that heart that is antithetical and living in rebellion before God. Each of us before Christ had a heart of stone But thanks to the grace of God, now a heart of flesh. Our hearts are desperately wicked. The Apostle John tells us in John 3 that wicked men who have a natural bent to sin love their sin. They love what they're doing. They have a love of the darkness. They have no desire to enter into the light. The light may be there, but they resist it. They run away from it. They want to be in the darkness because their deeds are evil. And that is how they live. They give an approval to ungodliness. Proverbs chapter 2. You and I, before the grace of God, found us. We not only committed wickedness before God, we approved of others who did as well. And all of this, as David tells us in Psalm 51, was that which we inherited by birth. Just because you were born, you have a sin nature, a nature that is antithetical to the God of heaven. But not only do we have a natural bent towards sin, as a result of such, we are then unable to choose righteousness we are unable we are unable to choose that which would cure us we are unable to do anything we are dead in our sin we have a natural bent to it we are wicked we have love of darkness we approve ungodliness we have this it's part and parcel of our who we are and as a result we are blind we are deaf we are hardened to the glorious hope of the gospel itself. In Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul goes to great lengths to explain this. As he begins his long uh, discussion of the the doctrine of justification and the the doctrine of adoption and sanctification as, as he pens these glorious truths in the letter to the Romans, we read in Romans 3, That none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God 
before their eyes. Paul wants us to know this. He wants us to see this. This is the before picture. It's ugly. It's disgusting. It's gross. It's sickening. It's difficult to read. There is no fear of God. They hate him. They rebel against him. They run away from him. All due to the spiritual death that everyone inherited from birth. Seems hopeless, doesn't it? Indeed, it would be. If Paul were to stop there, we would be a people, indeed, much to be pitied. We would be a people with no hope in the world, rightly and justly deserving God's displeasure in the eternal torment that would be ours due to our own sin. Now, Paul highlights various characteristics in Ephesians 2 as to this spiritual death. He tells us that as those outside of Christ, we followed the very system of the world. What the world loves, what the world loved, what the world loves, before Christ you loved. Maybe after Christ you love it too much too. That's sanctification. What the world wants, you want. All of their desires, all their passions, every motive, every issue. Paul says we follow the world system, following the course of this world, he says. He's not talking about the creation. He is talking about that which is dominates an antithetical, rebellious nature against the God of heaven. Our desires, our motives, our practices, our ethics, our priorities, our actions, every single thing before the grace of God found you was following that which was in, at enmity with the God of heaven. To make matters worse, he goes on to say that we not only followed the world system, we followed Satan himself. We followed that which he does living in bondage, lack of great freedom. We were slaves, as Paul says in Romans, we were slaves to sin itself. We walked this way in everything. Put a different way, there was nothing in us, nothing in you, nothing in me that could stand before a holy God and show any semblance of good All of it was miserable. All of it was awful. All of it was gross. All of it results in eternal separation from Him. And notice how Paul ends these first three verses. He says that all of these things that we once were in that before picture We were by nature children of wrath, justly deserving God's judgment, justly deserving his displeasure. The matter is hopeless, is it? There's verse 4. There's verse 4. God has to do something. Because we are unable to do anything. We would not even do it if we could. God must intervene. And he has. And he did. Look how Paul highlights highlights it for us there in verse 4. A great word of contrast. Probably the greatest contrast in the entire Bible. As he pivots now away from that ugly state, that black, gross picture, the before picture, as he begins to pivot now to turn into the reality of what must happen and who must be the agent and actor of it in order for us to change, in order for us to be accepted by him. He's the one 
I must do something. So Paul tells us that. He says there, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. God intervenes. He intervenes. He intervenes in type and shadow in the Old Testament as the Redeemer of Israel, the Redeemer of God's people. He intervenes in giving to us the Lord Jesus Christ, He who entered into time and space, our time and space, who took to Himself human flesh. God must intervene. If God doesn't intervene, we are hopelessly ruined. And He has and He did. God intervenes in the life of dead sinners. Paul doesn't highlight human ingenuity here. He doesn't highlight human freedom. He doesn't highlight an act of our will. He highlights God. The center of this entire passage is the grace of God who must intervene without which you and I would be ruined for eternity. But not only does God intervene, we also recognize that God was under no obligation to intervene. If he were, it wouldn't be grace, would it? It would be owed. God was under no obligation to save you. He was no, under no obligation to save me. Out of sheer act of his kindness, his love, his mercy, indeed his grace, God determined to intervene. Paul highlights that when he reminds us here, even after he, uh, highlight, even after he introduces the contrast, he tells us when, when was it that God made us alive? When we were dead. When we were dead in our sin. We weren't partially alive, which is not dead. No, I'm no doctor, but I'm pretty sure that if you're breathing even a little bit, you're still alive. No, Paul makes it clear that he intervenes when you and I were still dead in our sin. Being under no obligation, it's an act of pure and sheer grace, an infinite grace poured out upon sinners. What's his purpose? Why does he do this? That he might show forth for all time, for all eternity, who he is. That he might himself receive the glory as he demonstrates it through the work of his Son. As Paul tells us there in verse 7, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward sinful people. He does it through his son that he might show forth the bounty, the treasure, the glory of all that he is, a God of grace who would pardon sinners through the work of Christ himself. And he does it through the means of his kindness and grace. All of it's in those verses, wrapped up in those verses that we probably memorize even as children. For by grace you have been rescued from that miserable before picture. For by grace, Paul says, you have been saved through faith. And that, it's not your own doing. It was God's doing. All of it. From beginning to end. A gift of God. Theologians refer to faith as the instrument 
of our justification. It's a response indeed to the grace of God shed abroad in our hearts. That as we are called and drawn by him, we then irresistibly look to the God of heaven and believe all that he offers us in Christ Jesus that we might not live in that miserable, awful place, but look forward to the great inheritance, the great riches, all of it prepared for God's people, all that we believe. Before we would reject, before we resisted, before we rebelled, but now because of the grace of God, because of his great love for us, what do we do? We accept it, we believe it, we trust it, and we place our whole stock and hope in it. Put a different way, if Christ fails, we fail. And Christ cannot fail. By grace you have been saved. All grace. 100% grace. For if it were 99% grace, it wouldn't be grace anymore. All of it is an act of the God of heaven. The thrice holy God pours out upon you and me undeserving as we are so Paul says now as a result that picture that was described for us in the first three verses of the chapter has changed something is different indeed much is different all is different now We go from being dead to alive. We go from being hard-hearted and rebellious to ones who have a zeal, a desire, a willingness, a love for this God of grace that we might then obey him. As proof, as fruits of the grace of God shed abroad in our lives, Paul tells us that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. This is very much creation theme much like we read of in Genesis 1. But now he's talking about his redeemed people, his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared for you and me to do. We respond to this. This after picture then now makes us, wants us, causes us, moves us because of the love of God in us to respond in love to him. And what else can you do really? As recipients of the grace of God, do you not want to? Do you not long to? Do you not have a zeal to obey him? Look what he has done for you. Left to yourself, you are but ruined. But he has changed you. He has saved you. He has done this. He has done all of it. Our response then is love and obedience, a willingness to do all that he tells us, to deny ourselves, to seek first his kingdom, to hear the shepherd's voice as he speaks. Oh yes, you and I, we we blow it, we fall down, we fall on our faces, we sin, we run back to the grace of God, we run back to the cross, we plead his mercy. And he treats you like sons and daughters. And he pushes you onward. Grants you his spirit. That you might do that which he has prepared for you to do. All of it. In response. To grace. Grace alone. Nothing on our part. Nothing on your part. Nothing on mine. All of it is an act of a kind, gracious God who delights in the salvation of sinful people. The before picture, ugly, miserable. The after picture, glorious, beautiful. Which one are you today? Which one? Do you know this God of grace? 
without which there is no hope in the world for you. None. Maybe you're here this afternoon. In God's providence, you have come here. And you have never heard of the God of grace who saves sinners, not because you're good enough, because you're not, but because he is a God of grace. You look to him. You cry out to him, even as that tax collector did in the temple when he just looked to the heavens. Actually, he looked to the ground and he simply said, be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful to me. That's what you do. Even that is an act of grace. Maybe you're a recipient and have been for many years of the very grace of God. Are you walking in newness of life? Is there fruit on the tree? Are you demonstrating your love for this God of grace by being willing to do all that he asks you to do, commands you to do. It's a natural response, isn't it? To the recipient, as a recipient of something that you did not deserve and never would, if not for the grace of God in your life. Three things and then we're done. If you don't know Christ today, the call to you is to simply bow the knee to Jesus Christ. It is simple faith. There's no sin, my friend, that you have committed that can outrun this grace. You look up You look down, you look sideways, you look wherever you need to look, but you cry out for help to the God of grace. He never casts out a one who comes to him by faith believing that the Lord Jesus Christ has accomplished all that is needful to save you from that miserable place. For those in the after picture, Good works are part and parcel of your life. They don't merit pardon from sin. They don't merit anything. They are merely a response. That is to say, they are just simply the fruit and evidences of those who have received the grace of God, the fruit and evidences of a true and lively faith. And finally, as I began, as I asked you, I probed Think often, think often on the gospel. Think often on the grace of God. Look back over your shoulder through the quarter of time and see how the grace of God has guided you, has steered you, has been good to you. Think about how much Jesus Christ had to suffer that the God of grace then might be gracious to you. All of it, contrary to Rome, contrary to that which the reformers in the 16th century were fighting so strenuously against, all of it must be of God. It must be of Him if we are to be right with him. It is by grace that you and I have been saved. And it is by grace that he will deliver us safely to our heavenly rest. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for this grace that, frankly, words just fail to describe. It's infinite. It's beyond us but we are thankful that we have tasted of it, that you have been pleased in your eternal purpose to save sinners. Salvation is of you, all of it. And so we stand in awe that you, the thrice holy God, would be pleased to save even a one. We thank you that you have saved us all by grace 
through faith, to your praise, to your glory. We pray in the name of the one who made it all possible, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.